Well, I'm here today to talk to you about the Tower of Babel. Babel, Babel, Babel. How do you guys say it? Babel. Babel. You know, this is the number one question I get about the Tower of Babel. How do you pronounce Babel, Babel or Babel? You know what, Webster allows us to say it either way, Babel or Babel. A lot of times the English will say Babel, uh, I, I decided to look up uh, various other languages to see what they would say. In Hebrew, it's Babel. Uh, the French is very similar to that. They say Babel, and they actually stress the second part. German is Babul. Uh, Spanish was Babel. And uh, Greek, uh, the Greek form anyway, is Babylon. And I thought, you know what? With all these different languages coming out of the Tower of Babel, I'm sure it was spoken that many different ways, and no one could understand each other. So that's the one thing we can learn. You know what? We still have the same effects even today, right? Here in English. Well, I usually say Babel. That's uh, the way I grew up with it. So forgive me if that's not the way you're used to hearing it. Uh, that's how I'm going to use it in this particular lecture. Well, what kind of attacks are there when it comes to the Tower of Babel? There's a lot, isn't there? Probably one of the most popular that we deal with in today's culture is the issue of racism, which comes out of, uh, heavily out of an evolutionary worldview. Now, racism was not, uh, it was around before an evolutionary worldview, but it increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary ideas in today's culture. But we need to get rid of this term races. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit uh, in brief on this particular subject because this talk is not going to go into this in great detail. We've got plenty of other resources, uh, plenty of other uh, lectures and materials, things like that that go into this. But if everybody came from Adam and Eve, how many races are there? One. There's only one race. In fact, as Paul uh, here in Acts 17, 26 says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. There is only one race, which means we're all sinners, right? But I've had people say, but, but what about all those skin colors and stuff? There's people that's, that's really dark, there's people that's really light. Friends, we could get that easily, just from basic genetics. You know what? There's only basically one color, that is a brownish pigment called melanin. Some people have more, some people have less. And you know what? When the gene pool was split apart at the Tower of Babel, people took a particular gene pool to Europe, to Africa, to Asia. For example, the people who ended up in uh, Europe took genes for lighter skin. The people who ended up in Africa took genes for darker skin. The people who ended up in the Orient took genes for an almond-shaped eye. But friends, we're all one race. We just split apart the gene pool. But I'm not going to go into that in great detail in this particular talk. Like I said, there's plenty of resources out there. One book that I would highly recommend is by Dr. Charles Ware and uh, Ken Ham called One Race, One Blood. Uh, if you don't have it, you need to get it, right? The <laughs> fact is, you may need to share it with your pastor, with your elders, uh, maybe even with some friends. I grew up in an area that, uh, uh, as I grew up, I didn't think there was much for racism. But now I look back and I go back there, there was a lot more than I thought. So sometimes it just gets uh, infiltrated and we don't realize it. So we as Christians seem to be leading the fight against racism in today's culture. What I'm going to focus on are other attacks. Well, what are some of the other attacks when it comes to the Tower of Babel? Hmm. Well, let's take a look at what some of the scholars are saying. Here's a, a scholar, Stephen L. Harris. He says that the biblical story of the Tower of Babel was likely influenced by the Entomanonchi during the Babylonian captivity of the Hebrews. You know what he's saying here? It was mythology. People came up with it a long time afterwards. Who is that an attack on the authority of the Word of God? Absolutely it is. Well, the Glenn Beck Show had a Rabbi Lapin on there. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that, that correct. Uh, but look at this. They're, they're talking about the entire Tower of Babel account. They say the idea was that this hunter of men started to erase God. He became king. He's talking about Nimrod here. Let us make people all like bricks. All the same, not like stone. The mortar that will hold those bricks together is materialism. And we could go on with quote after quote, but they're, they're talking about how we are all the bricks. And, you know, what's holding it together is materialism. And the difference between these bricks and stones, uh, these are individuals. This is, everybody is exactly the same. The mortar that held the bricks together was materialism. Friends, you know what they're doing here? They're reinterpreting the account. They're basically saying, well, you can't trust it as written. Let, let, let's re, let, reinterpret it in light of today's culture. But friends... There's a problem with this. And you know, what they're doing is they're trying to get people to trust them, listen to them on the subject. Either they're saying that it's mythology or they're, they're trying to reinterpret it. But friends, this is an attack on the authority of the word of God. Do we need to reinterpret it? Do we need to say that it's mythology? Can it be trusted? Absolutely it can. See, the issue comes down to either you can trust an infinite, perfect God or you can trust fallible, finite, imperfect human beings, right? You see, that's where the issue's at. 
in today's culture, especially when it comes to the Tower of Babel. Well, what we're going to do in this talk, we're going to look at some of these different questions surrounding the Tower of Babel. And I want you to keep in mind that God is the ultimate authority on the subject as we look at these particular questions. Remember, what greater authority is there than God? None. Hebrews 6, 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. He is the greatest authority on every subject. And so what we're going to do, we're going to go through a series of questions, common questions that I get surrounding the Tower of Babel, and we're going to answer those particular questions, all right? And uh, we're going to find out that we can take the account as written. It does explain the world. Isn't that incredible? It's exciting. Now, to do that, let's read through the account. Now, do you realize Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9, that's all it is, nine verses, right? Yeah, that, that's more scripture than you get in some churches, right? Let's go ahead and read through it. Genesis 11, here's one through three. Now the whole world had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth." That was very mild judgment, wasn't it? Considering, you know, a hundred or so years before all this, there was a pretty violent judgment, wasn't there? Judgment of the flood. So I don't want to miss that uh, in this particular account. But I've had people come up and say, hold on a second. Isn't there a contradiction between Genesis chapter 10, right before this, and Genesis chapter 11? And the reason they say that is, well, hold it. In Genesis chapter 10, it's talking about all these different family groups that have all these different languages. And here in Genesis chapter 11, it says there's only one language. See what they're doing? They're looking back at Genesis chapter 10, where it says, you know, uh, the, the sons of Japheth, everyone according to their language. The sons of Han according to their language. Sons of Shem according to their languages. And all of a sudden, the next chapter says there's only one language, so what's going on here? Well, this is easily resolved when you realize that Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9, that's the chronological account. Genesis chapter 10 is the significance or the breakdown uh, of that. And we see this sort of thing in Hebrew. In Genesis chapter 1, that's the chronological account. For the most part, Genesis chapter 2 is the significance of what's going on on day, day 6. We jump in and we actually see what's going on on that particular day. So this actually solves it uh, very easily. Well, why were the people being disobedient? Hmm. Genesis 9.1. Noah's family comes off the ark and the Lord says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. We see that reiterated in Genesis uh, 9, 7. And this is a reflection of what happened in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, be fruitful, fill the earth. Now what happened? In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, they did not want to be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Do you see that? They knew what this command was. And they're in direct defiance of it. They're trying to disobey God. You see? Well, what happens when you defy God? <laughs> He's going to confuse your language, of course. Now, uh, I, I've had some people say, hold on a second. This has nothing to do with uh, being fruitful and filling the earth. They said, no, no, no. What? You weren't supposed to be building a city. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? And here's why. If the Lord came down and said, well, I don't want them to build a city. Let's scatter them out so they don't have a city. What they do? They went and built cities. Did the Lord continue to judge them <laughs> from all those cities? No, absolutely not. Uh, he served his purpose. Once people started to go to various parts of the world, they started to scatter, and that solved the problem. Now, here's what I've always thought. Do you realize Noah was a preacher of righteousness, right? And we always think of Noah pre-flood out there going against the, the, the pre-flood world, being a righteous person, preaching righteousness. Do you think he was preaching after the flood? That's well, possible. Second Peter 2, 5 and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. Preacher of righteousness before the flood here. 
You know what, I suggest he was continuing to preach righteousness even after the flood. I wonder if he was trying to tell these people, hey, you need to start filling the earth. And they were still being disobedient because they obviously knew the command, so obviously that uh, command had been passed on through Noah or his sons onto this next generation. But I caught something in here. In Genesis chapter 11, verse four, look what it says here. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered. Ooh, you know, that's almost a direct reflection of what was going on before the flood. Genesis 6, 4, men of renown. Remember, people were trying to make a name for themselves. And you know what? Right after the flood, here it was. People trying to make a name for themselves, weren't they? See the direct reflection of what was going on before the flood. Well, where did the scattering occur? Well, obviously Babel. <laughs> but where exactly is that, right? Babel is a place somewhere over in the Middle East. Everybody, uh, for the most part, agrees upon that. Uh, were they still at the ark? Was this uh, someplace near, near the ark? Probably not. Fact is, Noah and his family, the Lord said, go out of the ark. They came out of the ark. They didn't remain at the ark. They were probably ready to get off the ark, weren't they? <laughs> they were ready to get out of there. Uh, so they came off the ark. Now, you know what? Noah had the pick of the world. He could go anywhere he wanted and settle. And you know what? I think he did. I think he started to look around because what did Noah become? He became a farmer. Would you want to be a farmer up in the mountains of Ararat? <laughs> now it makes sense you're going to go find some place that's fairly fertile. Well, look what we see in Genesis chapter 9. People were living in tents. You know, Noah planted a vineyard. You know, so he went somewhere else. And then it says in uh, the, my third point here, as men journeyed. Remember from the east, they found the plain of Shinar. That's in Genesis 11. So people were moving around. They were shifting around. Wherever Noah settled, for the most part, either an east or west direction, because people kind of, well, that word east, sometimes people translate it as eastward or from the east, so there's some confusion over that. Either way, where Noah had settled, either east or west of that, is where this plain of Shinar is. Shinar literally means between two rivers, which is why people place it uh, between the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, Genesis 11, 2 says, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Okay. So most people say, okay, right here, right in between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Now I want to use this to clarify something. I've had a lot of people say, hold it. Does that mean that the Garden of Eden was in the Middle East right there in Iraq? There's the Tigris and Euphrates. Well, friends, I'm from Versailles, Illinois, which is named for settlers who came up from Versailles, Kentucky, which is named for Versailles, France. Names travel, don't they? It makes sense that the descendants of Noah when they came off and settled in this particular region, they named it for rivers that they were familiar with before the flood. Now, if we look closely at that river in Eden in Genesis chapter two, it's one river that splits into four headwaters. It's completely different, and it's even moving in a different direction. So these are definitely not the same ones. On top of that, these rivers are sitting on top of flood sediment, so they're definitely not the same river. So I just wanna clarify that in this particular talk. But one thing I want you to realize too is that the word in Hebrew for Babel and Babylon, it's the same word. We just translate it as Babel or we translate it as Babylon to kind of uh, distinguish between the later Babylonian empire. Remember with Nebuchadnezzar? Might think of Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego around that particular time to uh, distinguish these two. Well, when did the scattering actually occur? Well, big picture, after the flood and before the call of Abraham. Now, if we look... Uh, at some of the major events, at least according to Archbishop James Usher, the creation was about 4004 BC, the flood about 2348 BC. He has the Tower of Babel at 2242 BC. This is about 106 years after the flood. Now, he arrives at that date because he trusted a, a historian named Manetho, you know, uh, from a, a couple of millennia ago. Uh, Manetho was not the best of historians, though. What he claimed was the events that occurred at Babel occurred five years after the birth of Peleg. And if you look up those genealogies, Peleg was born 101 years after the flood, so Archbishop Usher puts it on 106 years after that. Uh, the Bible simply doesn't give us an actual date for the Tower of Babel. Now, is this a reasonable time frame? Well, it's possible. Other chronologists have said 101 years. They actually place it right at the birth of Peleg, I've heard some others say 130 years afterwards, I've even heard uh, some other dates thrown out there. Well, I thought, well, this is significant. Do you guys remember the countdown for the flood? How long did the, did the Lord give before the flood? Genesis 6-3, 120 year countdown. Gives you an idea how patient the Lord is. Hey, you know that 101 to 130 years? That's right around that 120 year patient time frame of the Lord before he gives this little mild judgment, isn't it? Yeah, so it does make sense. Now, I've had people say, hold on a second. Uh, you know, 101 years, 106 years, you gotta be kidding me. It has to be hundreds of years. 
And the reason that they want to throw that out there is because you have to have enough people to build that huge tower. Well, here's how you respond to that. Uh, How many people are required to build a tower of unknown size? Ah, see, we have no idea how big the Tower of Babel was. According to the Bible, it was a big tower that reached to the heavens. Does that mean it reached out to where the space station's orbiting? Absolutely not. Fact is, there are nearly 30 ziggurats, uh, towers, uh, uh, for example, in the Mesopotamian area. Some of them still reflect names as though they reach up to the heavens, and yet these things are not huge skyscrapers or anything. For example, there's a temple of the stairway to pure heaven, the temple which links heaven and earth. Uh, that's in Larsa. Uh, but that just gives you an idea. But see, Genesis 11:4. it just says whose top is in the heavens. You know what? It does make sense here. Well, was the tower built or not? Ooh, what do you think? I mean, we oftentimes see images of a partial built tower. What does the Bible say, though? Genesis 11:5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. So the tower was built, wasn't it? But didn't they stop building something? Yeah, they did. Sometimes we confuse that with the tower. It was the city that they ceased building in Genesis 11:8. Uh, and the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they ceased building the city. Well, of course they're not going to build the city anymore. They just had a big lo- loss of population. People were going over. You don't need as much, right? I mean, of course, city here probably implied a whole bunch of different uh, uh, buildings and things like that as well, not just uh, places to live. Well, what did the tower look like? Hmm. You know, a lot of artists have decided to uh, paint a tower of Babel, and, uh, you know, people even still do that today. Here's a famous one from Peter Bruegel in uh, 1563, and you kind of see how it's kind of winding around. Uh, Gustav Dürer. Uh, in 1865, he has one. He's kind of winding the opposite direction. He has it going all wet in the clouds. See how high that one is. Uh, but you know what? We start looking at some of the ziggurats in the uh, Mesopotamian area. Uh, most of these are somewhat of a pyramidal type shape. Uh, here's one at Uruk. And uh, here's another one at Ur. This is uh, kind of the, the place where Abraham was called out of, if you remember. Uh, Sir Leonard uh, Woolley, he's the one who uh, did extensive research on this particular one. Uh, do you realize that the Hebrew word for tower is migdal? And migdal means tower, of course, but figuratively it means a pyramidal bed of flowers. Now, well, that's interesting. You got that pyramidal shape in there. And you know what? We find ziggurats all over the place, not just Mesopotamia. We find them all over the world. In fact, uh, specialized ziggurats, such as pyramids or even some of the mounds and stuff, would would almost be uh, uh, fitting within this particular definition. But we find them all over the world. That makes sense because people were taking their building projects and taking them wherever they went. Where's the question I get? There's about 6,900 languages nowadays, about 7,000 languages. People say, did they all come out of Babel right then? Well, let's think about this. 6,900 at least spoken, written languages. Were there that many people there at the Tower of Babel? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and start adding it up, there's about 78 different language families that come out of the Tower of Babel. 78. Now, that's not even close to 7,000, is it? That's not even remotely close. So how do we get 7,000 languages? Well, let me tell you something about English. English is one of those languages that is always changing. You know how I know that? I married an Australian. Yeah, I married Ken's daughter. That's right. You you guys are familiar with Ken Ham, right? You know, it's tough to stump Ken Ham, right? I mean, you go ask him a question. He's got a good biblical answer. I love listening to to Ken in debates or on the radio, you know, because somebody will ask a question. Good biblical answer that quick. Do you realize I asked him a question one time that completely stumped him? He didn't know what to say. I asked if I could marry his daughter. (laughs) English has huge variety, doesn't it? I mean, you go down to Australia, you go to England, you go to the United States, you go to Canada, eh? Yeah, we've got a lot of different English. But you know what? English has changed a lot. If you go back to English a thousand years ago, it almost looks like German. Did you know that English is actually classed as a German language? See, the Angles and the Saxons that came over dominated England, and that's the, the German root. They came from Germany. But then the French came in and conquered them in 1066 when the Normans conquered England. So they added a French root. English is actually kind of a combination of French, German, and, well, we throw a whole bunch of other stuff in there. Where I'm from, we come up with words. <laughs> Did you know where I'm, where I'm from? A number of people call cats codgets. Don't ask me where that one came from. But, hey, codgets. We just sometimes come up with words. But see, English has always been changing. But English, German, it goes back to one language, family. 
Now those linguistic experts like Ethnologue or Vista Wide uh, World Languages, they estimate that there is a maximum of 94 language families out there. A maximum. Now how many people came out of the Tower of Babel? About 78 different language families? Minimum. That doesn't count Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah, or Peleg. I left him off as well. And then in some cases, there are some other sons and daughters in there, so there, there may have been some others. Ah, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? We're right in the ballpark, aren't we? We really are. And some of these languages, of course, have been changing and filtering out to where we actually subgroup it as different languages. But different language families, that makes sense. Now, compare this to the world. What does the world believe? The world believes that we all went back to some evolutionary ancestor that had some sort of grunting primitive language. They expect about one language family. Who's closer? Yeah, it's great to be a Christian, isn't it? It's exciting. But you know, the language was split apart as well. And of course, the languages have been changing. Sometimes a nation would conquer another language and, and you'd have some mixing within the language. Sometimes the language would die and so on and so forth. Well, here's a question I get all the time. Was Nimrod in charge forcing a rebellion at the Tower of Babel? You know, you go back to Josephus. Josephus mentions, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. Uh, if you jump down, he, he tried to get them not to ascribe to God. He changed the government into tyranny and said he would be revenged on God. Fact is, he said he would re re avenge on God for killing their forefathers. Was Nimrod in charge? More recently, there was a book called The Two Babylons uh, by Reverend uh, Alexander Hislop. Look what he says in here. I'll read the whole quote on this one. As the Babel builders, when their speech was confounded, were scattered abroad on the face of the earth. That's absolutely right. And therefore deserted both the city and the tower which they had commenced to build. Hold it, the tower was built, right? Babylon, as a city, could not properly be said to exist till Nimrod, by establishing his power there, made it the foundation and starting point of his greatness. Hmm... Was Nimrod forcing a rebellion at the Tower of Babel? Let's look at the biblical account. Genesis chapter 11, verses two through four, I threw them in here. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks. Can you see the trend? Were these guys all being forced to do this or were they rebelling in unison? They were rebelling in unison, weren't they? Well, where does this idea come from? Well, I suggest it's a Jewish myth that we need to watch out for. Titus 1.14 says, not, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. Josephus did a lot of great stuff. But you know what? He's not the Bible. And neither are we. The Bible is the absolute authority. The, the Bible is what's perfect. We're the ones who make mistakes. And we need to always compare that to the Bible. And that's even a lesson for us. We need to always remain humble, always go back and check everything with the scriptures. But see, here's where people get this idea. They jump back to Genesis chapter 10, and starting in verse 9 here. He was a mighty hunter. This is talking about Nimrod before the Lord. And therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad, and Calneh in the land of Shinar. And from that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehobothir, Calais, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Calais. Whew. You see what they're doing? They're looking at Genesis chapter 10 saying, look, this is the beginning of his kingdom, therefore he started Babel. And then later on, when they read in Genesis chapter 11 about the account, they think Nimrod's in charge of it. But we need to go back and look at the big picture again. Genesis chapter 11 is the chronological account. Genesis chapter 10 is the breakdown of the significance. Now, is Josephus uh, uh, and uh, Reverend Hislop, are they, are they absolutely wrong? No, I would suggest they got a lot of truth in there. I think Nimrod did take over at the Tower of Babel, but it was after the scattering occurred. That became the first center of his kingdom. And from there, he started to spread out and then went into the land of Assyria. You see, there would be some big problems, big problems of Genesis chapter 10 actually occurred before Genesis chapter 11. Uh, here's why, look. If, if Babel and Eric and all these places were the beginnings of his kingdom, then Nimrod was spreading out around the world. There would have been no, no sense in judging him. But look at this too. Assyria. Well, Assyria was already another place. You see, they would have already been scattering out. You see, it makes sense that this does follow uh, in chronological account from Genesis chapter 11, uh, 1 through 9. Well, by what means did people travel from the Tower of Babel? Did they take the space shuttle? No, that just retired, didn't it? Do you think they flew? I seriously, anybody think they went by boat? 
Ah, that's possible, isn't it? Genesis 10, 5. From these, the coastline, the island of the maritime peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, everyone according to their families, into their nation. So yeah, they could have went by coastline, absolutely. They could have went by boat. Think about this. Noah and his sons, according to the genealogies, were still alive at the events at Babel. Do you realize that Peleg, according to the genealogies, he was the first recorded person to die after the flood? Noah lived 350 years after the flood, Shem 500 years after the flood. These guys were master shipbuilders. Do you think they could have passed that technology on? I mean, let's face it, they built a boat that survived a global flood. They did better than the Titanic engineers. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's look at some of the, uh, the, the more simpler boats. These reed-style boats, say, from Egypt. Did you know that in 19... Uh, uh, 69 and 1970, they did, they did experiments uh, trying to see if they could transverse the Atlantic Ocean. They did them raw one and raw two. Raw one uh, was doomed after it hit a big storm, but raw two, with supplies, with people, made it from Morocco to Barbados in 57 days. So even those could transverse the ocean. Could people have traveled by boat? Absolutely, they could have. But do you, do you think they could have it really, really did transverse oceans like the Pacific or maybe the Atlantic? I mean, a lot of times we think they went by the coastlines, things like that. Well, take a look at this. Are you guys familiar with the Olmec? The Olmec were precursors to the Mayans in Central America. Uh, we don't know if they kind of uh, intermixed with them. We, we simply don't know all the history. But they're one of the few uh, North and South American uh, groups that had a written language, an ancient written language. And people have been trying to study that language for the longest time. They've been trying to tie it into language families in North and South America, and it just doesn't mix. Well, finally, a man... Uh, who is an expert in African languages, looks at it and says, I can read that. <laughs> he said, that's very similar to a language we have in Mali in West Africa. Ah, oh, well, do you realize that the Olmecs, uh, uh, by some of their pictographs and stuff, claim that they came from the east by boat? That does make sense, doesn't it? So it is kind of neat to see some of these little nuggets. Well, where did all the people go initially? This is the fun part of the talk. Or the boring part of the talk, depending on how you want to look at it. You know, when you start looking at all these different people groups at the Tower of Babel, you know those, you know, you don't want to read them. They're genealogies, right? But these different names, every one of your ancestors is up on the board right here. Direct ancestors. Isn't that incredible when you think about it? Well, I decided to start tracing some of these people out. Because by right time, I'm a bit of a mutt. I've got Portuguese, I've got German, I've got Irish, English, Dutch, you name it. Uh, I, I'm, my wife, she has some Chinese in her as well. So our kids, I'll tell you what, they're, it's hard to believe they're as pretty as they are. I have to throw that out there. My kids are just gorgeous little kids. You guys might be biased too, but I think mine are the cutest in the world. But you know, when we start looking at these various names, and even if, we, even if we can't pronounce them, we can, we can do a little bit of history study on them. Just to give you a, a few things right off the bat here. Uh, Meshech, one of Noah's grandsons through Japheth, that's the old name for Moscow, Russia. There's still the Meshera Lowland out there, and there's a, a Meshera State Park uh, out in that particular region. Javan in the Old Testament. When we see Greece in the Old Testament, that's the word Javan. We actually translate, that's Noah's grandson. Land of Canaan, we see Canaan all the time. Uh, you know, of course, that's where the Israelites uh, went in and conquered that particular region. Cush is Ethiopia. Uh, they still call themselves Cushites today. Uh, Mitzrium, that's the Hebrew name for Egypt whenever we translate Egypt uh, in the Bible, uh, at least in the Old Testament. Assyria is from Asher, one of Noah's grandsons. Aram was one of Noah's grandsons. Remember, Jesus cried out in Aramaic on the cross. See, uh, the Arameans or the Syrians had actually conquered a big region there. That was a common trade language. But what I've decided to do is start looking at these guys in more detail because I wanted to know where was my ancestry. And you might be thinking, well, where's your ancestry? So what I did, well, I would look up biblical passages. I looked up historians, history. I used language family, a little bit of genetic factors. I even looked at some of their mythology and oral tradition. And I've got so much more information, I can only put a certain amount up on these maps. But let's just see if you guys can follow and see if you know a little bit about your ancestry uh, to kind of know maybe where you came from. If we look at Ham, a couple of his sons, uh, Mitzrayim, here is Egypt, here's Cush, Ethiopia, this region. Uh, Put was kind of over in this region, moved over. And a lot of the Cushites and the Puttites actually uh, uh, pushed on down through Africa. Of course, we have the Hindu Cush. Uh, you might think the Middle East, Nimrod, right there uh, in the Mesopotamian region. That, they all came out of Ham. I separated out Canaan specifically. Uh, Canaanites, boy, they went all over the place, it seemed like. Of course, we have a number of tribes right here where the Israelites took them out. Uh, the Sinai Peninsula, named for the Sinites. 
Uh, they were a group uh, that came out of Canaan. In fact, is some of the Sinites came out and went to the area that we know as China, the Orient, uh, the Philippines, places like that. You might think of the Sino-Japanese War. You see, we still see a reflection within that name of the Sinites. Uh, if we look at uh, Japheth, and, you know, the Europeans, by and large, kept a lot of uh, records, a lot of written records specifically, especially with Greece and Rome and places like that. So we can actually trace a lot of these in even more detail. We have Galatia, 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 the Gauls, the Welsh, uh, Celtic Caledonia. They, they all came out of Gomer. Not to be confused with Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please don't confuse it with that. <laughs> this is Gomer, the grandson of Noah. I separate out uh, Ashkenaz specifically here. Uh, a lot of the Germanic peoples came out of Ashkenaz specifically. The, the, the Jews still call uh, Germany Ashkenaz uh, even today. A lot of the Norse, the Anglo-Saxons uh, uh, over in England uh, would have come through uh, Ashkenaz. Uh, some of them even settled in a region uh, that we know of as Turkey. Uh, others, uh, uh, Tagarma, uh, Ashkenaz's brother, uh, that's Turkey. Uh, the, the different Turkish-speaking groups uh, probably came all out of Tagarma. Uh, Armenia, for example, or the mountains of Ararat are. Uh, Magog has a lot of the Slavic groups, a lot of the Scythians, even the Scots came out of Magog, and there's a bit more. A lot of people have tied in the Eskimos and the Aleutians uh, kind of in North America to a language family very similar to uh, the Balts, uh, Baltics, the Finns, and the Huns, which is kind of interesting there. Uh, there's some more history we can always talk about uh, at other times. Meshach is uh, uh, Cappadocia. That's at least how I've always pronounced it. I think I've heard some other people pronounce that a little different, but you might think of Moscow in that particular region. Uh, Javan is the, the Greeks. A lot of the coastline places throughout the Mediterranean uh, were settled by a number of Greeks. Even the Britons came out of uh, uh, Greece uh, by some of their history. Uh, Tarshish there in Spain. Some people have questioned this particular Tarshish, uh, if that's one of them, uh, but uh, you know, I'll leave it on the map here. Even Saxony, the, lo the lower regions in there. Uh, if we look at uh, Tubal, uh, you might think of the Tubal River up here, Tobolsk in Russia. But you know what? All the Iberian groups came out of there, and the Italics, and the Irish all came out of Tubal as well. So if you have some Irish ancestry in here, you may have come through there. Uh, Tyrus, so this is where uh, uh, the Thracians came from, uh, as well as the Jutes up in this region. You, you see some of these reflections in the name of Thrace. Uh, there's still the Tyrus River there in Europe. Uh, you might think of uh, Troy. Remember the Greeks conquered Troy, uh, that particular area. Tyre was originally uh, by Tyrus, and uh, of course the Phoenicians conquered them. Well, if we turn to Shem, I actually left one of Japheth's sons off, and that was Madai, because the Medes who came out of Madai actually linked up with the Elamites, who Cyrus later changed the name to Persians. The, remember the law of the Medes and the Persians? Think of that, that group, those two groups kind of came together. You might think of Bactria, uh, some of the other places uh, people continue to go to. Asher, we know of Assyria. There may have been some others. Uh, Arxfaxid, this is the lineage of Christ. And so you can kind of see people moving all over the place. The Lord had a tendency to call people out and move people around, didn't he? You think of Abraham coming out of Ur. You might think of the Israelites down in Egypt coming out, wandering, and then uh, finally going into the promised land. Uh, Joktan uh, inhabited big parts of uh, Arabia. The Arabs claim that only two of Joktan's 13 sons ended up in Arabia. The rest went to India. And you know what? India is a melting pot of languages, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So uh, that makes sense if you get that many different language families and they're deviating and so on. Laud, Lud, uh, uh, a lot of the southern parts of Turkey. You might think uh, the book of Revelation, it, it, it was written to a number of different churches there. Uh, one of them at uh, Laodicea, they would have uh, been some of the descendants of Lod here. Uh, Strabo, a his Greek historian of about the time of Christ, he actually says that the language of the Lydians was almost extinct at his time. He only knew of one place where they were still uh, uh, speaking that particular language. You might think of Aram, this is the Syrians, the Phoenicians. Carthage, who fought against uh, Rome, uh, for example, Aramaic was the, uh, the common trade language. Of course, Jesus cried out on the cross with that. But you guys are probably tired of maps now, right? Yeah. Did you see some of your ancestry in some of these, though? Yeah. You know where it gets tough, though? The farther away you get. When you get to places like uh, uh, America or Australia, places like that, it gets tougher because what happens is sons or grandsons move so far, then the next son or grandson moves so far and so forth. And a lot of times these regions are named for this particular person or this one who's not recorded and we don't have good written records uh, to take it back to the Tower of Babel. Now, uh, we can kind of uh, assume that uh, Cush and Put uh, uh, had populated other parts of Africa. Joktan uh, primarily hit uh, India. There may have been some others in here, the Sinites and then other people coming on around. But when you get to places like Australia, how in the world first did people get there? Do you think they walked to these places? Oh, it's possible. Do you realize that most creationists believe that there was an ice age that followed the flood?
What happens in an ice age? You take a lot of water out of the ocean, put it on land, so the ocean level drops. And when the ocean level drops, it exposes land bridges. So in theory, people could have walked all the way to the Americas, all the way to Japan, all the way to England, uh, places like that without having to take a boat. So it's possible that they did walk there. Well, either way, people obviously made it there. We suspect that some of Magog's descendants made it up here to where the uh, uh, Eskimos, people uh, like that were, perhaps some of the Sinites. Uh, but there are a number of language families here in the, the northern part of the United States, even down in the, the southern uh, uh, parts of uh, South America, North and South America just in, by and large. But there's only maybe seven to nine or so. We get some isolates and so, and so on. But some of these people we still haven't been able to trace from the Tower of Babel. Same thing with uh, Australia, you know. Who is it that uh, really populated those areas? I would love to find out a little bit more research uh, on these particular areas. Hey, it is exciting. It's a great area of research. And I've been working with a few people, but uh, maybe one of these days we can get a book out of this and uh, you can look at this stuff in a little bit more detail. But yeah, people could have went by boat. Uh, let's face it, the people who made it to Hawaii didn't walk there, right? <laughs> so they did have to go. Well, what about ancestor worship? Do you realize cultures all over the world have ancestor worship? Uh, for example, you might think of uh, Shinto or Greek mythology or the, the Norse or Germanic mythologies. People, the, the, a lot of ancestors were worshipped. You know, in the case of some of the Greeks, they said that they're descendants of the gods, of the immortals, and so on and so forth. Well, why would this be? Well, think of it this way. If your ancestors, you know, such as your great, 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 great grandfather outlived you, would you start looking at them different? <laughs> start thinking, man, I'm getting old and decrepit. I mean, I feel that way already. But then you look at your great-great-grandfather and it's like, boy, he looks like he's 28 years old. What's going on? You know, people start looking at him different. They start thinking, wow, these guys are like immortal. We're, we're mortal. These guys are like, like gods. Notice how people elevate people to a higher status. I suggest that's what's been going on uh, for these various religions, whether it's Shinto, Greek mythology, uh, Egyptian mythology, and so on and so forth. They elevated their ancestors to a godlike status. If you look at a lot of the Greek mythology, the immortals still died. They just outlived everyone else. And so that does make sense. Well, were there any extra biblical accounts of a language split? You know, we find flood legends all over the world. You know what? We find Tower of Babel legends all over the world too. They're everywhere. This is fascinating to see. I, I, I'll just put a couple of examples up here. Uh, reading in Plato, uh, his book Critias. In the days of old, the gods had, the, remember the gods, they're, they're, they're ancestors who outlived everyone, uh, had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. There was no quarreling, for you cannot rightly suppose that the gods did not know what was proper for each of them to have, or knowing this, that they would seek to procure for themselves by contention that which more properly belonged to others. See, they're talking about a split right there. Uh, here's one from uh, some of the Maidu Indians in California. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, basically, they said, suddenly in the night, everybody began to speak a different tongue except that each husband and wife talked the same language. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? That's kind of what the, the Bible's saying. So we do find these sorts of accounts all over, the, all over the globe, and that's a great study in and of itself. Well, let's get back to this. Why is all this biblical authority issues? I mean, one of the things we did in this talk, we went right through there. These are common questions we get surrounding the Tower of Babel. And you know what? When we trust the account as written, it makes sense, doesn't it? It explains the world. But you know what? We're in a culture today where people are appealing to, say, modern scholars who say this is mythology. They're appealing to, to other scholars who say, listen to us, trust us, let's reinterpret it for you. Friends, do we have to do that? Or should we step back and be still and know that God is God? We need to trust his account. When he writes a historical account, the way this is written, we can trust it as a historical account. That's what we need to do. We do not need to appeal to human authority when we can appeal to God's authority. John three twelve says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? The context of this, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And they've been talking about earthly things. And you know what? Nicodemus just really didn't, didn't quite grasp this stuff. And yet, he wanted to hear about the heavenly things. So often, we get so excited about the heavenly things. And that's good, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we neglect the earthly things. What we did in this talk is we talked about a lot of earthly things, didn't we? We saw maps and genealogies. Let's face it, that stuff can be kind of boring. But you know what? It explains the world. 
It is the authoritative word of God, and it makes sense in today's culture. Those are the earthly things. And you know what? Because those earthly things are true, that means the heavenly things in the Bible are also true, right? It really is. If the history is true, the message of the gospel is also true. And let's not miss this. I mean, we're talking about the Tower of Bible. We're looking at all these different questions that people have, and we're seeing how to answer those from a biblical perspective. We're looking at the earthly things. Friends, let's not miss the gospel in all this. Let's not miss seeing Christ at the Tower of Babel. For example, Genesis eleven seven, 7. Let us go down and confuse their languages. Their language. Let us. You see, it's a reflection of the Trinity, the triune God. You see Christ right there. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our own image. You see the reflection there? It's incredible to see. Christ is right there involved the whole time. But even the word used in the account there, when the Lord came down to see. That's the word Jehovah which is a variant of I am, or I am who I am. That's where that name comes from. Remember, uh, uh, it's used in Exodus 3.14. But think of John 8.58. Before Abraham was, I am. You see, the Lord's involved the whole time. But also keep in mind, you know, 120 years or whatever it was before this, at least uh, more than a century, there was a very violent judgment with the flood. And yet, what do we see? an extremely mild judgment, a simple confusing of languages. You know what? That is the grace of God. And we need not forget the grace of God. And we need to always remember that when it comes to situations like this, when people try to attack the authority of the word of God, we need to stand on the authority of the word of God and we need to give the Lord the glory and the honor in all of this. But I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys.